Hi, good afternoon, everyone. We're all gabbing out in the hallway, so we probably better get started here. Welcome to CSIS. Uh, I'm Joanna Nesseth. I'm Vice President for Strategic Planning here, and I head up our work on food security. And we're here today to release a new report that we've put out. It's taken us um, some time and research to put this together, but we're really looking at the question of scientific partnerships on agriculture uh, between Africa and the United States. This is an area where we've had a long legacy of partnership, intense, deep engagement. We've got this uh, fantastic story of um, scientists throughout Africa who've been trained at U.S. land-grant universities and American ag scientists in universities who have done a lot of work internationally, but we knew that this was had, had faded considerably. And we wanted to take a look at some of the ways that we could enhance uh, engagement. Uh, at the time we put the study together, <laughs> Feed the Future was getting started and was going to be really looking and focusing at this. Um, we're very fortunate to be joined by a number of people here today. I think you all know that, unfortunately, Colestis Juma could not make it today due, an, due to an emergency, um, but we've got a lot to talk about anyway. I want to start by introducing Bill Garvelink. Ambassador Garvelink is a senior advisor with CSIS. He is uh, with us working on our food security and development work. Um, he actually helped to stand up Feed the Future, spent a lot of time talking with ag ministers in Africa, and as he and I have talked over the time that he's been with us, he, he just talks about how many conversations he had with ag ministers saying, I'm kind of the last of my breed. You know, I was trained at Purdue or at Michigan, but there aren't a lot more scientists who are being trained. Hi, Jen. Come on up. Um, so I wanted to ask him to open up with a few comments and, and reflections on what he has seen and heard as he's been talking with folks, and then uh, turn it over to Max Angerholzer from the Lounsbury Foundation. Come on up, Bill. Uh, thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I, was, I was noticing we were talking about setting up Feed the Future. David Road is here somewhere, who was actually the brains behind most of that um, as we set up a bureau in, in AID. Uh, but what I'd like to just, just talk for a couple of minutes about Feed the Future and, and uh, where it's going and or it, how it relates to research and that sort of thing. And it's one of the most interesting uh, initiatives underway in the U.S. government right now, and it's President Obama's Feed the Future Global Hunger and Food Security Initiative. And it's really an effort uh, to reduce hunger, uh, reduce rural poverty, and malnutrition in the developing world. And the initiative builds on a host country commitment and leadership, which is a requirement of the initiative, and then it focuses on smallholder agriculture with a special emphasis on women and girls and on nutrition. Uh, for this initiative to be most effective, it must be anchored in agriculture or in Africa relevant agricultural research, and it has to be lashed up with universities and the private sector. Uh, we all know that cereal production uh, has to be increased by 70% in the coming years worldwide. And in Africa, uh, agricultural cereal production has to double. And we also all know that there's going to be less land and less water uh, to do that. So it's going to be a rather difficult ex exercise. And to accomplish this, uh, we really have to revitalize our focus on agricultural science and technology. But it must be agricultural science and technology that is useful and appropriate to Africa. In 2010 and 2011, as Johanna mentioned, I traveled around to a lot of the countries in Africa that are priority countries, the Feed the Future initiative, and spoke with heads of state and ministers of agriculture. And as I did that, they reflected on the scientific exchanges between Africans and Americans and the uh, educational opportunities at U.S. institutions, and they pointed out how important that was in the agricultural development of their country. Um, they also lamented the fact that that uh, has all dried up, and we really don't do that sort of thing uh, anymore. And as Johanna mentioned, I, I spoke to one minister, and uh, a minister of agriculture, and he pointed out he was the last agricultural scientist uh, in the government trained by the United States. Uh, and that's a sad state of affairs, I think, I think for us. And in meeting with these ministers, uh, we talked a lot about the scientific exchanges 
and the graduate level training. And that has to be, in their minds, renewed and reactivated, but in a little bit of a different way. Uh, the leaders emphasize that the training must be more closely linked to African country needs. And the students should do some or all of their research, not uh, in the United States, but in their, their home countries. Um, and the ministers really stress that the, that the programs have to be designed to meet the needs of local farmers and the requirements of national and international private sectors, uh, which is something that a lot of the training that has gone on in years past has, has trained folks to deal with uh, UN agencies and those sort of organizations. And I think now the training has to focus on the needs of the private sector, which are different. Um, than, than working with the, the multilateral organizations. And this report here reflects the thinking of the African leaders, certainly the ones I've talked to, and it sets out a road map <coughs> to greater scientific engagement on African agriculture between Africans and Americans, scientists, universities, and our private sectors together. And I think if you look at this report, along with the Feed the Future research initiative uh, strategy that has been put together. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good companion piece for, for how we should proceed here. And so if you haven't, I recommend this to you. And with that, I will uh, turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. It's been um, great to have you here and have your eye on this as we go through. And. Um, I know you have to head to Louisiana shortly, so we'll let you go. I want to turn next to Max Ingerholzer. Max is um, sort of an old, old friend of, of mine and of CSIS. He's someone who's been with us for 10 or 12 years now. Um, he currently is the executive director of the Richard Lounsbury Foundation, which is a foundation that really focuses on the role of science and policy. They've got a strong emphasis on um, scientific diplomacy, and he actually came to me a while ago and said, you know, we really want to do something looking at scientific diplomacy in Africa. What do you think? what would make sense? And I said, you have to talk about agriculture. That is where the U.S. government is really placing its emphasis in terms of um, scientific engagement. And there's a real opportunity to talk about this and to explore it. So I want to invite Max to say a few words, talk about your, your sort of theory and philosophy on scientific diplomacy and how we got into this together. Thank you, Johanna. And uh, I think you covered basically everything I wanted to talk about, so I could sit back down. But again, I'm Max Angerholzer. I'm the executive director of the Richard Lounsbury Foundation. As Johanna mentioned, um, we have partnered with CSIS for many years, um, so I'm very happy to be here today, and I'm glad to see um, so many people in this room. Um, the Lounsbury Foundation, as Johanna said, we're a small foundation. We're modest by foundation size. Um, we give in science policy, education, and research. And I think based on our long-term commitment to international science, a few years ago, we, we tried to move into the area of science diplomacy. And being the small foundation that we are, um, we try to practice venture philanthropy when we can. And so I would describe that as trying to find new, exciting opportunities and initiatives, give these programs seed money with the hope that that will grow into something new, exciting, and long-lasting. And I think science diplomacy is an area where that's certainly taken place in the last decade. Um, you know, the, the um, foundation has been active in countries in the last few years, such as Iran, Syria, Cuba, Burma, Iraq, Israel, Palestine, India, Pakistan, um, uh, North Korea even. And so I think for us, we, we um, really believe that science is a universal language. And even if these diplomatic barriers exist, and sometimes, especially when they're high, there is a, an, an avenue, there is a reason for cooperation and discussion through science. And I think taking a historical approach to it, you know, a lot of this took place during the Cold War between Soviet bloc scientists and American scientists, and also um, with Chinese scientists before Kissinger and Nixon opened up China. And so I think we feel that even when diplomacy is not strong, and there are these hurdles that if you can build these relationships through science, education, engineering, that these are pathways, these are relationships that can be scaled up if, if um, diplomacy comes to bear and if the relationship improves. And so I think in some of these countries I mentioned, that's our hope. I think with Africa, I'm especially excited to be here because as Johanna mentioned, I feel like that's an area of great opportunity. 
I think the U.S. should be doing more in Africa, and I think especially um, in an area like science and in agriculture, that's a strength of ours that, um, that um, we can bring to bear. I think as far as our foreign policy goes, I feel strongly that science and education, engineering, these are arrows of our foreign policy quiver that we don't take good enough advantage of. And I think, you know, especially with what we've been doing abroad in recent years and we're overstretched in certain ways, I think this is an area of our diplomacy where we could be doing a lot more. Um, we are certainly not the only group doing this. You know, there are other great foundations like the Carnegie Corporation, the Luce Foundation, Plowshares that are involved in this area. Fortunately, they have deeper pockets than we do, so they can have more effect. And CSIS, I, I would say, has been a leader in the area of science diplomacy and international cooperation. There are other groups like the National Academies and AAAS that are doing that too, but CSIS is definitely a leader. I'm happy to be here today. I'm especially excited with, uh, with, with how the report turned out. I know um, the Lounsbury Foundation is pleased to be a part of that. So thank you, Joanna. Well, thank you so much, Max and Bill. Um, now I want to turn to these two great panelists. We have three women here. Um, <laughs> And I, I will say we had, we had hoped to have an African scientist with us, and with Dr. Juma being unavailable at the last minute, we couldn't find a replacement, but we did. One of Max's um, requests was please try to have as much um, scientist-to-scientist discussion as you can. So we really tried to do that in our working groups. And I can explain sort of how those rolled out. But let me first introduce uh, Jennifer Cook, who heads up our Africa program at CSIS. She's been with us for about 12 years. We both started in early 2000, as it turns out. Um, and has uh, really been a great partner in understanding what, uh, what the systems are in African universities, in the science community, and has done quite a bit of research in this area. Um, Julie Howard is a longtime friend and mentor and expert who could have written this report herself, but she's busy implementing. Um, so we're really pleased to have her here. She's the chief scientist um, at USAID looking at food security in the Bureau of Food Security, looking at Feed the Future, and has been conducting a wide-ranging effort to really uh, produce and uh, put together a strong, focused uh, research agenda for Feed the Future, and she's going to talk about that today. I'll just give a few comments about the report, <clears throat> and then I'm going to turn to Jennifer to give some background, and then I will go back and um, share some specific comments about what we're actually saying. And then we're going to have Julie kind of do the wrap-up and really take us into what Feed the Future is doing. So um, first I want to note, there are a couple people who helped on this report uh, considerably. Kristen Wedding, who's not here because her, her baby was sick today, uh, Anna Applefield, Farhat Tahir, and then Richard Downey, uh, also with our Africa program, all were very engaged in the discussions and um, thinking about what should we really say based on our interviews and, and conversations. We really set out to kind of look at this question of where has where the scientific cooperation been? Why is it faded? Is it going to come back? You know, could, should, could we go forward and say, yeah, we should really um, re-energize this, this habit of having African scientists study in the U.S., get, um, get doctorates, do their research? We didn't know what we'd come out with, um, and we, we definitely came away thinking that's probably not the best way to go. Um, but we really wanted to uncover some new paths. We wanted to look at how the private sector is, is influencing the way agriculture is developing, what are extension systems looking like, what is this web of research institutions in different countries um, doing in terms of cohesion of a research program. Feed the Future really emphasizes demand-driven efforts. So as a country lays out its agricultural plan, what does that mean for the CGIAR Institute in the country, for the national research system, for the universities, for the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Ed Education? All of these groups have some role to play in this field, but how is that actually shaping up? Um, so we really set out to kind of answer these questions and come up with um, some thinking on that that is reflected in the report. So if, Jen, if you could please take us through we, we came to the, the, the questions that we put together in the beginning of the study were really based in large part on some work that Jennifer and Richard had done, uh, some field studies looking at the state of um, the conversation on genetically modified food in a couple of African countries. In their research, they really found a lot of fractures within the, the debate around science and agriculture in these countries. And that was really the genesis of how we started to think about the issue. So maybe you can share some more. Sure. Um, yeah, I thought I'd, I'd start a little bit. I mean, Johanna has led the Global Food um, Security Project here, and really a number of reports have, have 
looked at food security from a variety of, of angles. And obviously, there's a, there's a huge amount of, a huge number of issues that have to be addressed to bolster um, uh, agricultural productivity and effective distribution in the developing world. I mean, we talk about infrastructural deficits, the predominance, particularly in Africa, of small scale versus large scale. Uh, the shortage of inputs, trade barriers, and I think very importantly, um, national agricultural policies that really stymie uh, farmer incentives in many ways. And all of these are going to be critically important to overcome in the short term to kind of unleash economic potential. But when you look longer term, when you look at the need to double uh, global food productivity um, in the next 50 years to, to meet demand, um, if, you've, if you're in the face of soil depletion, water scarcity, pests and disease, climate variability, and, and climate change, you really are going to have to look increasingly to science, technology, and innovation uh, to drive significant growth in productivity. So advances in agricultural research, obviously, um, that prioritizes productivity um, have resulted in major yield increases in the Americans and, uh, Americas and Asia, uh, but this revolution largely passed Africa by. Uh, between 1976 and 1996, spending on agricultural research in sub-Saharan Africa increased by just 1.5 percent uh, compared with almost 5 percent in the rest of the developing world. <clears throat> and in fact, uh, as we saw, important investments that were being made in African uh, agricultural research in the 60s and 70s uh, this is by African governments themselves, by the international community, and by the United States have really declined over time. Many of those important partnership withered. So now there's a generation of really stellar African scientists and agronomists who are in leading positions in many African research institutions. Um, but what you don't see is the next generation and of a kind of a robust crop of young scientists coming up through the ranks to fill their shoes. And this is at a time that science is becoming much more complex, and the need for science and innovation, as I said, is going to be um, much more demanding. So the question becomes, how do you insert agricultural research more firmly into the food security agenda? I know um, this is, it's, it, there's an opportunity here because there isn't attention to this. And it's not just ag research for the, the sake of research, just ag research really nilly but research that prioritizes pragmatism, impact, and localized relevance, um, that builds the science and research establishment within African countries so that they can communicate credibly uh, and consistently, I think, with their, with their governments, with the public, uh, and with farmers themselves. Um, and at the same time, building the next generation of scientists, research innovators. So one of the problems is this, this isn't a quick fix idea. And I think one of the reasons that agriculture, this, these kinds of investment have dwindled over time is because the U.S. has moved to more of a, a, a need for quick impact projects. And educating a cadre of scientists and researchers for the long haul um, is not a quick fix. The, the senior agronomists that you see in African institutions right now uh, were trained 15, 20 years ago, and they're now kind of at the peak of their careers. Um, to, you know, we're, we are going to have a gap, and I think looking, looking ahead, you really have to start now to build those capacities. <clears throat> The big partnerships with the United States and USAID um, kind of have withered, dwindled dramatically. We used to train a significant amount of, uh, of uh, researchers generally, but agricultural researchers particularly here in the United States. The training model of bringing them here to land-grant universities generally was very expensive and often more focused on U.S. agriculture priorities, the localized priorities at that particular university. Um, CGIAR, um, there's some concern uh, that it was moving away somewhat from a, from a demand-driven model uh, and research areas to areas that were of more interest to the developed than the developing world. I think there's a significant rethink within that system um, to, to move back to demand-driven research. And then within African countries, a move away from investments in research and development overall to kind of the, the, the priorities. Um, you know, the more immediate priorities, uh, and proportionally, very little of public spending on, on research in Africa 
remarkably, uh, just 4 percent of overall spending by African governments on research and development goes to agriculture and research. So I think as we think of what is it that the United States and international community can do, we also have to be thinking very hard of how do you mobilize African governments themselves to make this much more of a priority. Um, so the, the, we, we brought together, with the support of the Lounsbury Foundation, really just an excellent uh, a group of uh, development expertise, agricultural ex uh, extension specialists, uh, private, public, and international arenas, um, and looking at, at three specific questions. I'm not going to go into great detail on the findings. It's a very dense report. I think in some, I mean, readable but dense. <laughs> well written. <laughs> very well written. Excellent prose. <laughs> yes. um, but it looked at really at, at the three specific questions: the current state of agricultural science and research in Africa, how these various research establishments can be supported and coordinate priorities and opportunities. Obviously, big hu human capacity gaps, institutional gaps in many countries, although there are some centers, real, real centers of excellence that it may be worth kind of I I investing in, underinvestment, as I said, by the governments themselves, a lack of political support, and I think that becomes a vicious circle because there's not a community to kind of champion the idea, and so the science as an investment area of priority gets kind of marginalized uh, within budgetary debates. And often, uh, very often, a lack of a national research strategy that can, that can guide a kind of pragmatic, relevant research. Um, there are a lot of players involved in this. There are the national um, research centers, which are oftentimes kind of where the, the great magnet for the science capacity of, of, the, um, uh, of a particular country, and, you, and, and some of them are really truly excellent. You have universities, and I would say within the research agenda in Africa, uh, research establishment in Africa, universities are, are generally the very weak link. And I think that's um, universities, uh, since I would say the structural adjustment of the 1980s, have been really corroded from within. Oftentimes, and we heard this in many conversations in Zambia, Kenya, elsewhere, they've become more kind of training or extended high school, people would say, where it's just teaching rather than the real hard research um, that's connected to anything. Some of the research that's done is fairly abstract. It's not really feeding into what the national uh, research centers are doing, what the local immediate priorities might be, or, or any kind of a national research agenda. So one of the big challenges is how do you, how do you get universities, which are after all the, the feeding pool for the, for the next generation of scientists, um, much more mobilized, capacitated, and connected with kind of the real priorities of the country at hand. Um, and uh, the, the report outlines maybe some new models rather than the old model of, of bringing researchers here to American universities. And I think Johanna will talk a little bit about the conclusions on that. Um, new players include the, the foundations are playing in a big way, and particularly the AGRA initiative, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, bringing new resources to bear. Now, is it done within a national research agenda? Um, you know, this is a question that occurs in health as well. When you have big donor foundations, are they, are they who are doing you know, brilliant, innovative work often, but are they aligned with kind of what a national research agenda um, might look like? Um, I think there are efforts to, to kind of bring a more strategic, coordinated approach, and the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program, CADEP, uh, is, is one effort to do this. It sets a, a standards and kind of best practices for bringing integration among these many players uh, and kind of creating kind of a strategic vision on research, uh, but I think it's how it's implemented is extremely uneven within Africa. Um, and, uh, and, and as I said, there's some s exceptional universities, but there, uh, is, there's a long way to go there as well. <coughs> um, current state of agricultural research universities, how can they improve the capacities and ties with other research centers? I've, I've talked a little bit about that. What are the new kinds of partnerships that we might bring to train both individuals, uh, students, professors, create institutional linkages? And then finally, what role for the private sector? I think there's huge untapped uh, uh, potential there. Overall, their investments have been fairly small in agricultural research, but they, 
but there are a couple of very significant um, uh, high impact contributions. Um, and what can they bring in terms of sustainable capacity that they leave behind, in terms of technologies, capacities, partnerships for, for the long run, and how, again, do they fit into a national um, research strategy? I'm going to end there, but in terms of the diplomacy side, I mean, I think, um, I think one of the, and, and this, this has been true in health, it's been true in a, a number of other areas. There's only so much that the international community can, can insist upon uh, within, within, a, within a particular country. Um, and I think more and more, particularly as we're looking at major fiscal constraints here, the expectation is going to be that African governments themselves take this more and more in hand. And if, 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 if they want it to be a priority, we, we can support them in that. Um, but it's going to be very hard to force this as a priority on them. And so building the, the demand for it within African countries for, <coughs> for research capacity that's relevant, I think that's going to be a big challenge for diplomacy and, and, and implementers as well. Uh, so I think Joanne is going to talk a little bit about some of the new models that people came up with to um, strengthen these kind of partnerships across these institutions. Thanks, Jennifer. That's a great background and um, really good, good context for where things stand. Um, and I think I'm, I'm amazed that we have like 100 people here today, which is amazing because ag research is not the sexiest topic in foreign <laughs> policy and security circles. Of course it is. Um, so we're, yeah, we're finding ways to make it sexy. So after we, and, and this, this is a 25-page study. It only scratches the surface. There is enormous complexity and there's just all kinds of details we could have gotten into that we, we didn't. So we want to just put it out as a framing document. But I think in, in all of our conversations, the, the idea that really came forward um, overall was that we face a massive challenge over the next 30 years <coughs> of ramping up agricultural productivity. And we can't leave Africa out of the mix. We just can't pass it by. And so we're going to need new tools and we're going to need new science uh, to do that. And figuring out better ways to cooperate and to engage are going to be need to be a priority. <clears throat> so, um, and, and I, I personally am so proud of what the U.S. does on agriculture, on our research, on our technology, on our science. It's an amazing potential export, and we don't think about it in foreign policy circles, but it really is phenomenal. So I think looking at the fact that Africa's got to be a priority as we look to meeting food uh, food demands in 2050, looking at the fact that so many rising economies sit in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. You've got all kinds of growing economies, all kinds of new demand for not just um, wholesale products but all, or wholesale grains, but also uh, processed products. There's a real, uh, a much greater incentive now than before, I think, to invest in this area. Um, so uh, some of the things that came out as we, as we went through our study and will be uh, embedded in our findings were as follows. I think the first issue that came up, we were pleasantly surprised to hear no one said we need a whole lot more money at this. No one said we got to go back to the old situation, we got to put a lot of cash into this. And that was really helpful because we're not going to be able to do that. Um, so we wanted to look at ways that are really cost conscious and fiscally fairly, um, fairly conservative in terms, I think that's next door. Someone's <laughs> testing the microphone. Someone totally disagrees and wants us to spend a lot of money. Um, so, so ways that are cost conscious about doing this. Um, one, one comment that came up over and over was just communication <coughs> and coordination. So those are some areas that we really focused on. So the new thinking that really came out, first of all, research in situ is very, very important. Um, having the model of researchers come to the U.S., do their full graduate studies, and then go, go back or maybe not go back to their home countries um, that, that's just passe. It's not, it doesn't work that well, and it's just not uh, financially feasible. But there are a number of models that we looked at. <clears throat> the Foreign Agricultural Service is a domestically based agency, but they have a lot of interesting tools that we looked at and talk about a little bit in the report for doing shorter studies or fellowships to bring people here to look at focused problems. So doing, doing research in in, in African soils, in that in particular climate conditions, is really important in order to tackle some of the challenges of, of drought, uh, the, the necessary um, changes and challenges in drought tolerance and pest control, some of the other areas that you might do plant breeding around. Um, so research in situ is a really important theme. 
focusing on African specific research problems, um, building a community of people who understand science and research, just having the sort of knock-on effects of having a researcher in your family or community and uh, a group of people who kind of understand the importance of this area really has an impact on the entire community and how people think about its importance going forward. Um, and then obviously the rising cost of education. Um, in our statistics, education has doubled in the past just 10 years, just the rising cost of U.S. public university training has doubled in the past 10 years. So we know that, that those, are, those could be valuable approaches, but we're not going to ramp them back up. So I think as we looked at some of the opportunities going forward for areas that could have an impact that would be sort of high value, low dollar uh, opportunities that could really play out, um, we looked at in our, in our study we looked at um, focusing on research problems. Instead of just doing broad research, I talked to the former Ag Secretary Dan Glickman, and he said, you know, I went to this, I did this tour, and I went to this African Research Center, and it reminded me of going to NASA in the 1980s uh, when I was on the Space Committee. Everyone was just looking at the same problem for decades, and they never really reversed trends and looked at a focused specific problem that they could actually solve. So focusing on research problems I think is an important theme and I think Feed the Future has really taken this uh, to, to heart. Um, looking at how do we make a corn, a, a version of corn that's drought tolerant? How do we combat this one particular kind of pest? How do we just ramp up production? Those are all important questions and focusing on those are really important. Um, and, and looking at some of the U.S. sponsored fellowship, as, as I mentioned, like through the Foreign Agriculture Service and other areas, uh, looking at CRISPs, for any of you, uh, you can look for a definition of it's a collaborative research support, support program. And basically, um, you know, there's a, a peanut crisp where there are collaborative research programs between a univer universities in the U.S., universities in a particular country, and maybe a, um, a CGIR research program to look at a problem of how do you raise productivity or how do you combat a particular problem. So those focused research priorities really should, um, really should be placed high on the list. Um, some, of the, so, some of the areas that uh, came out so strongly to echo Jennifer's comments were really to prioritize institution building. Um, focus on individual training, making sure people and scientists have opportunities, but they bring them back to their institutions, they train students, and they develop um, programs and research plans based on those, um, those in independent individual contributions that they can make. Um, the private sector was a theme that I think is still emerging. We had an interesting discussion around a particular project, the WEMA project, the West Africa, or the um, Water Efficient Maze for uh, Africa project. This is a partnership between Monsanto, where Monsanto donated the germplasm, um, uh, an NGO, and um, uh, research centers in, in several countries in Africa. And it is fascinating because there's a great potential in the private sector. The U.S. private sector really in many ways owns a lot of the ag research agenda in the U.S. So there's a lot of capacity to share that information, but there also, it really came out how many challenges there are to, ha to make sure that there's an honest broker, to make sure that you're dealing with the intellectual property rights, with the ownership rights. Um, they had to deal with biotechnology regulations uh, to make sure that once this particular crop is developed, it's actually able to be used because it is a biotech crop. So there are, there's a lot of opportunity, but real challenges around that kind of seed development. Um, but on collaboration, another area that actually is quite promising and should take some, some more, uh, get some more focus is not just around seeds, because I think we want to be careful not to just say, throw seeds at the problem, we'll grow our way out of it, because it's just not always the, the, the issue, but looking at food processing, food management, marketing, those are all areas of real high value, where if you put some research and effort on them, um, you can really in increase farmers' overall uh, incomes and you can increase communities' uh, prosperity by looking at higher value approaches. Um, along the lines of cooperation, we also focus to a degree on ways to leverage the experiences of other countries, especially Brazil. Brazil had a phenomenal model of really investing, along with USAID, in a research approach to bring large tracts of land into, uh, into development and into production. It's been very successful. 
Uh, it's created a, a, a powerhouse agricultural country, but it, some interesting lessons within that in terms of how they how the Brazilians communicate the importance of agriculture, just a strong communication uh, component to sharing with the public and with farmers and creating demand for this new kind of science and technology as a critical component. And that leads me to really um, our last sort of point around communication and coordination. It came up frequently that ag ministries, national, um, national research centers, uh, education ministries, universities, all have to be talking to each other. In the development of a national ag plan, you got to include the ag, um, the schools of agriculture. You got to make sure that students are being trained on the stuff that's going to be relevant going forward to the national priorities. Uh, and also just broader public communication, talking about the reason and, and importance for making, If you, I think, a very valid point to encourage increased investment within countries, but then also to make the case for why that's important nationally to national economic growth and development. So again, this is a huge topic. We tried to tackle it with some high-level uh, focused ideas, um, but open up for discussion in a bit, and thanks for your interest. Um, and now talking about what's actually happening, I'd like to turn to Julie, who is an, agro uh, an ag economist by training um, and has the same experiences that we're talking about and just brings a lot to the discussion. So thank you, Julie. Go ahead. That'd be great. Thanks very much, Johanna, Jennifer, and, and Bill. It's, uh, I guess Bill is no longer here. Okay. Um, it's great to be here. I want to say um, I'm sorry that I'm not Calestus because Calestus is, is really an authority in this field, many of you will know, and he's also an incredible character. So I have to tell one, one quick Calestus story. Um, I've been just in USAID for under a year. So um, before then, you know, worked together with, with CSIS and, you know, really wanted to to point out that without CSIS, I think we would not nearly have the kind of visibility that we have today to food security and the need to sort of take a long-term view rather than just sort of what are the short-term fixes to food security, but really, you know, what's the strategic approach um, and what's the U.S. role in, in building uh, long-term food security. So in that context, um, I was so pleased to have the opportunity to introduce Calestis one day to um, one of the, the congressional architects of the strategic approach, Connie Bayet, who was, is now at uh, the Center for Global Development, but then she was sort of the right-hand person for Senator Luger in, in designing a new approach to food security. So I was very nervous, you know, but I was very anxious for Connie to meet Calestis, and so we met for a, a lunch. And what does Calestis do? You know, he's sort of this larger-than-life person who, you know, says hello to Connie, but in, in, in extending his hand, um, he presents her with this small keychain, which is a cow. Um, and so, you know, here she's sort of looking down, and, and Connie can be a little intimidating, don't you think? Yes. She's looking down, wondering what to do with this, this cow that this, this strange uh, person uh, had given to her. But anyway, he said that this was his calling card, and he knew that she would always remember him if he gave her this token of his esteem and uh, the importance of, of remembering that not just crops but livestock. So. This is what you missed. Uh, who knows what Calestis would have come up with today had he been here. Okay. So, um, so anyway, so I mentioned our thanks to CSIS and, and, and really, you know, not just the initial report that came out in 2008, right? Um, but you're continuing attention to these, these areas of focus, agricultural research and science capacity building. And, um, you know, I, I hope you know that, that your work and, and the discussions that have informed uh, your reports have, have really very much influenced the development of the Feed the Future initiative. So thank you very much for this. And, um, and really taking the long-term view, I mean, having this in, in the national security spectrum um, is something, is, is, is different, you know, for all of us who've been working in, in, in this area for, for decades and decades. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, I, I'm hoping today that you will allow me to indulge my inner wonkiness um, because um, I, I have a, a series of, of comments a pretty detailed comments on, on the report. And I think, you know, kind of going through those and, and probably not in, in intense detail, but that will allow me kind of a frame for explaining a little bit of, of what's going on at USAID and Feed the Future, and particularly what new things we're doing with, with, uh, with building scientific capacity and research capacity that address some of the issues. So I'm hoping that um, to share some of these insights and new things and our continuing challenges with you in the spirit of, 
you know, we continue to need your help um, and your, your feedback uh, for us. So before I launch into um, my, my inner wonky character here, I do want to introduce Clara Cohen, who's sitting over there. Clara, can you wave? Okay. Um, Clara is really our, our right-hand person on, on everything to do with capacity strengthening. She thinks about it a lot. We're very lucky to have her. She comes from uh, years of experience at the National Academies and thinking about how to build African equivalent of National Science Academy. So now we, we have the benefit of her, her brain on these same problems in Feed the Future. So um, the first thing that you should know, and you already know this, is that, that President Obama and the members of his uh, administration, I mean, including Administrator Shaw um, and including Secretary Vilsack, and let me just say USDA has been such a strong partner for us uh, in, in developing and implementing Feed the Future, along with other agencies, but especially in ag research and capacity building USDA. All of these people, led by President Obama, care so very deeply about science and technology and, and really um, building this capacity and, and, and uh, you know, sort of thinking about the role of, 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 of the U.S. back in the 70s and 80s as we were discussing and building a whole generation of African scientists and really cognizant of, of, of the need to kind of go back and revisit the model but end up, you know, with a new generation of institutions as well as scientists. So, I mean, it's just terrific to have that kind of support from the very highest level. And, you know, I mentioned we're working with USDA on this and State Department. We're also working with the OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy. So this is really a, an area that has the attention at the highest levels. Um, so let me proceed uh, and focus my remarks on, on each of the four areas, uh, Johanna, that, that you talked about um, and sort of delve into a little bit of, of feedback on, on what we're doing at, at USAID and across Feed the, Feed the Future. Um, you talked about, Johanna, the, the need to, to sort of go back and focus on problems, and I really liked um, the discussion about uh, Dan Glickman going to NASA, NASA and wondering why they were continue to look at the same things. I, I think that's really right. Um, you know, that, and, and we're really trying to, to get to that point as well in Feed the Future where we're more problem focused, less about sort of generic capacity building and more about how do you develop the capacity um, to solve certain problems, knowing along the way, you know, you're going to get your, your master's, your PhD level, level scientist. Um, uh, you make the point in the paper that it's important for African countries to set their own priorities, and we really have to connect training and institutional capacity development to those priorities. Um, I want to take a, a small detour here and just say that um, we agree. I mean, Feed the Future, is, as Bill mentioned, you know, is really built on the back of, of CADAP, the Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program, you know, which, which really is about countries defining their own priorities and the U.S. and other donors really investing against those priorities. So, so now the small problem with, with CADAP is that in the development of CADAP compacts and country investment programs, um, what was left off initially was attention to the capacity needed to implement those, those investment programs. So um, about a year ago, I think October 2010, right, um, those of you may know this, uh, there was a meeting of ministers of agriculture and education in Kampala, Uganda. I mean, that sort of walked us back and said, you know, really CADAP needs to now take on board these capacity um, requirements. But we're a little bit slow, I would say, um, in, in Africa so far in going back and saying, okay, we have these country investment plans for the next five years, for the next 10, for the next 20 years, um, what are the capacity needs? And how can we in the government and how can donors invest against those, those, those programs? I, th I hope that Clara is nodding vigorously at this point. Yeah, because I, th I think that's, that's a frustration for us, you know, because we're, we're primed in Feed the Future and our donor partners are primed to, you know, pay attention to country priorities. But it's not clear yet in this sector. Um, and it's not moving, you know, as fast, I think, as, as we hope. One, one, uh, one hopeful thing about this is that um, we are, are collaborating with the World Bank um, and other donors and um, ANAFE and RUFORM, our, our African partners in this endeavor, um, to really do a, a consulting study in collaboration with our partners to better understand what capacity is out there, what institutional capacity, you know, take a sort of um, quick look um, at the country investment program so we can do some initial planning. Um, that's, 
I think Clara, uh, uh, the RFA for that consulting study has gone out. Um, that that World Bank study is is in progress now. But this is what we expect will be kind of a major mechanism, you know, for the U.S. and other donors to begin to invest against country determined priorities. Uh, so so anyway, so that is a quick aside on that. But just to know we're a little bit behind uh, behind the ball in terms of not having initially linked CATAB with capacity building. Um, the report recommends expanding linkages to U.S. institutions using the problem-centered approach, and, and, and we agree, and we're looking at different models for doing this. Um, the administrator spoke at the uh, Association for Public and Land-Grant Universities uh, annual meeting in San Francisco back in November, and, and we also spent a lot of time talking with U.S. university presidents at that time, and, and really the major message from the administrator was we are back in this field. You know, this is very, very important to us. Um, it's important that we think about um, capacity building because, I mean, he intends uh, through our, our USAID forward reforms really for the agency to work itself out of a job. And you really can't do that without having the, the people in place, uh, you know, the scientists and researchers. So the message at APLU was we're back. And, and indeed, we've, we've, we've increased our funding to U.S. universities for primarily research capacity building pretty significantly uh, since 2008. Um, I think our our uh, calculations are about 65% increase. Um, and so last year we spent uh, almost $50 million uh, on, on research and, and training type activities. So we are back. Um, but the other message from the administrator in San Francisco was um, we're not content, as you're not content, you know, with the old models. And there's a nagging feeling um, on our side is that you know, U.S. universities have undergone a lot, a lot of change um, over the last five, six, ten years. You know, basically, uh, change probably they weren't looking for because of the the incredible, you know, incredible shrinking state budgets. But nevertheless, you know, universities now, U.S. universities are a different place than they were um, a decade ago in terms of figuring out how to how to work across disciplines, figuring out how to use uh, distance education, how to use ICT. You know, many of the things that when we look at the challenges in, in, in Africa, um, we need that kind of expertise applied in, in Africa. So this is the administrator's challenge to the U.S. universities, that let's figure out different ways for us to work on key problems. And, and let's not... Um, Let's get away from some of the, the previous models, which, which are sort of very, very directive from the USAID side, um, and instead provide you with a, a vehicle where you can suggest how you'd like to work on some of the major development challenges of our day, including building institutional capacity. So about, um, Clara, again, this is about a week ago, I think. Yeah. So uh, an RFA went out uh, for public comment. Um, which is essentially a new way of working, USAID, um, with the U.S. university community on major development uh, challenges. So invite all of you to, to look that up on grants.gov. Um, and the public comment period, I think, is open until January 31st. Okay. Um, another way that we're really getting to this problem-centered um, uh, approach is I think in the past we've had a lot, we've had a history of our, our, our research and capacity building uh, investments coming from the center, coming from Washington, and not being particularly well connected with a separate stream of investments from our, our country level missions. That's, um, so we're, we're trying to end that now. Uh, and we're really seeing a, a rebirth of, of national missions and regional missions investing um, directly with, with universities. So that's very, very promising. Okay. Um, let me skip very quickly through the discussion of, of biotechnology. There's quite a, a good discussion of biotechnology in the paper. And, and um, I have to say, even before I came into to USAID, this is one of the areas that I was most proud of, um, for the work that USAID and partners is doing in, in biotechnology, because um, the focus has been really building biosafety uh, capacity as well as scientific capacity. So really for over 15 years, um, and we have some of the architects of, of, of this, this program in the room, um, biosafety capacity building has been a focus, enabling the development and approval of, of science-based biosafety laws in, in uh, developing countries. 
facilitating the drafting of regulations to make the laws operational. And ultimately, you know, we hope providing a, a pathway for smallholders to access the, the same breadth of technologies as, as we enjoy here in the developed world. So we have a few programs in this area. Um, this will be familiar to some of you, the program for biosafety systems, um, which supports the development and implementation of biotech regulatory systems. Um, this provides policy assistance, provides technical training and risk assessment and regulatory decision making, all these things. And we're seeing real outcomes from this kind of work. Um, field trials of, of cowpea in Nigeria, uh, banana, a disease resistant banana in Uganda. And really this would not have been possible without you know, the, the very careful uh, construction of this enabling environment. Um, and you mentioned the African Agricultural Technology Foundation. I think also, Johanna, um, this is one of our key partners, uh, facilitating public-private partnership, partnerships to access proprietary technology. Um, so they're a strong partner with WEMA, for, with Monsanto, for example, in the Water Efficient Maze Project. Okay. Um, the report talked about post-harvest food loss and food safety. And I wanted to have a, a small digression on this. I just got back from a, a trip to Ghana, um, where I was helping to launch a, a research inception workshop. Our, our research program has undergone a pretty significant change over the past year. Um, again, you know, we did our new research strategy in collaboration with, with USDA and the US uh, university community. And one of the things that we've done is, is really focus our research in, in four geographic areas. And this is aiding uh, our, our quest to really make sure our research investments are matching up with, with mission development investments. Um, so this was a research inception workshop for one of the four areas. So this is the Sudano-Sahelian uh, cereals zone. So how would you sustainably intensify this zone in northern Ghana and Mali is our focus, but of course this zone then will extend across Africa. Um, just to mention quickly, our, our other zones are the Ethiopian highlands, uh, the east and southern Africa maize and mixed uh, cereal systems, and then we have uh, uh, in the indo gangetic uh, plains of, of, of India and Bangladesh. So an interesting thing about this workshop, which brought together another point that you talked about, how are we working with CG partners, this is actually the new way that we are supporting, part, partly supporting the, the CG reforms. The, the, the consultative group of international agricultural research systems. You know, this is one of the, the crown jewels, I think, of, of science worldwide. You know, they are, uh, played a key role, the invest, these investments, Rockefeller, Ford Foundation, others, um, really in, 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 uh, in, in green revolution technologies, and now have just gone through this very extensive reform, you know, to generate the, the next uh, technology reform that we, we need. So um, in this collection, very interesting collection of, of most of the CG centers uh, working um, on the Sudano-Sahelian cereals belts with all of our US University CRISP uh, programs. So these were the, the peanut CRISP and the, uh, the, the natural resource management CRISP, the fish CRISP and others, plus the national agricultural research systems, plus the sub-regional research systems, you know, plus our missions, plus donors who are, are funding the development side of things. So we're talking about research, but also this is research into development. So this area, northern Ghana, southern Mali, really a focus now for, for donors. So we had folks in the room talking about what's the technology that we want to develop, uh, how do we want to intensify this system, you know, but how also do we take the technology that's, that's in the pipeline and connect it with the development partners who are working on seed regulation, who are working on commodity markets. Um, and one of the topics that came up again and again and again is this post-harvest loss issue. Because I think, you know, I was, I was so surprised because I was, I was really pushing researchers to say, what's your top line expectation for how this system could improve, you know, in terms of productivity? And I said, can you say within five years we can, we can double the productivity of the system? Um, and researchers always being conservative, I was shocked. When, when they came back and said, you know, if you're not just talking about yield, if you're talking about post-harvest loss, if you're talking about improving the marketing system, that's a low bar. That's a really low bar. So, so very fascinating. And, and this post-harvest area is something that we're also taking back into our, our bureau and, and doing sort of a scan you know, what more we might do in this area, both on the development side, because there are technologies out there, some of our, our private sector partners, Grain Pro and others are marketing um, uh, 
uh, uh, polyethylene bags um, that I've seen uh, in use in Zambia and elsewhere. There are also other technologies. So it's, it's a mix of that, you know, plus what research do we need to do to improve uh, post-harvest techniques because improvements in that area are as good as a, as a yield increase. So I agree with you on that. Um, let me sort of now turn to, okay, so we talked about problem focus. Let me run through this quickly um, and not wonk you out, I guess. <laughs> okay, the second area was, was prioritizing individual capacities to improve institutions. Um, and I think, you know, we're all in agreement with you in the paper that, that we really can't return to the, the large-scale U.S.-based training models of the past, but we really have to move towards a model where the local institutions are increasingly having the capability themselves uh, to generate high-quality uh, graduates. So I think we agree on that. Um, you know, it is a question of, of I think, what's the, what's the mix, right? Um, what's the mix? It's, it's not that we're not going to do some training in the U.S. I think for specialized training especially, um, for some PhD level training, we need to continue that. But certainly, and I've heard this time and time again from, from researchers, from scientists, the role of short-term training. You know, and we've been talking with our USDA partners um, in ARS. You know, is it possible, you know, as we identify researchers having a very specific need, a specific skill that they need to, to learn, uh, can we think about um, putting them in your lab, you know, for, for a time? So I think that there's a, there's a lot of fruitful discussion going on there. Um, let's see. Um, agree that the strengthening individuals is necessary, but really not sufficient for strengthening institutions. Um, and agree wholeheartedly, you know, that, that you can't just focus on, okay, let's train X number of, of plant breeders or X number of, of, uh, of disciplinary specialists. But you also have to look at, you know, how are we using ICT, for example. Um, how are we strengthening the, um, the administration of the university or the department? I mean, how are they going to be funded? I had a discussion with the University of Ghana Faculty of Agriculture this week and asked them just that question. I said, gosh, you know, your, your, uh, your government has just discovered oil. Um, are you going to them and, and sort of asking them how much they intend to, to give to you? And, you know, they, they hadn't quite gotten that far yet, which surprised me. You know, it seemed to me that they, they should be there maybe every day. Um, asking where they are, are they moving up on their priority list. But they did say um, that they are having more success with getting private sector companies to come in and endow chairs, for example. So I think that's the beginning of the conversation. But, you know, it, it seems to me when I speak to, to, uh, to African universities, they're often still in the mode of, you know, well, we're used to fund being funded by the government, so the government needs to fund us. So they're not, you know, we're not doing a good enough job yet, I think, in, in providing those sort of skills that will um, allow them to um, diversify their training. Okay, third and I think final area, fostering collaboration with the, the national scientific community. Um, Johanna, you talked about um, working with private sector partners and um, I've talked a lot with Natalie of Monsanto about the WEMA project and I think, I mean, her excitement about being able to include national partners um, and also allow some of the national partners uh, to go for training to Monsanto labs. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think we'd like to try and do more of that. Um, uh, I think there's, there's a kind of shocking disparity. I mean, she, she was telling me um, a few months ago that um, things like just digital moisture meters, you know, are sort of huge breakthrough technology for many of these scientists. So, I mean, we really have a job to do, not just to train, you know, but to make sure that, that labs are outfitted and, you know, that these, uh, the departments have a way of, of renewing their, um, um, their equipment from time to time. So, um, I'd like to see, we have more and more research going on with private sector partners, especially um, related to, to GM traits. Um, we're working with Arcadia Biosciences on developing rice and wheat varieties with increased uh, nitrogen use efficiency and water use efficiency and salt tolerance. Um, we're also working with, with series, similarly, um, gene and trait discovery-based agricultural biotechnology companies. And I think, you know, with these partners, we haven't yet explored the opportunities, potential opportunities for, for training, um, but this is something that, that we'd, like to, we'd like to do. Um, and 
just so you know, uh, I think, again, about 10 days ago, we issued a special call for a, a, a new set of proposals uh, to, to motivate a new set of public-private partnerships um, geared at, at, at developing a new climate-resilient cereal varieties. Um, Kay, you talked a bit about uh, Brazil uh, and Embrapa, and, you know, of course, that's kind of the, a classic success story for us because, I mean, USAID uh, funded and U.S. universities very, very involved um, with developing the network of, of Brazilian universities and, the, and Embrapa. And now, um, indeed, you know, we're working with Embrapa in, in Mozambique um, and elsewhere. One other country. Hmm? Um, I think they're looking at that, but Mozambique is the strongest partnership. U University of Florida, Michigan State involved in that. So Embrapa is is involved in this trilateral trilateral effort um, to strengthen Mozambique's uh, Institute of Agricultural Research, and and we're looking forward to doing something similar in India. Um, so it'll be sort of a three-way: India, uh, Kenya, Malawi are the initial uh, partners with that. So we've just uh, a couple of months ago, sent out a call for proposals, and we're, we're looking forward to making those awards soon. Um, in the area of linking with the CG system, I talked a little bit about that, so we're very excited about that opportunity because this has brought up a, a, a big problem for the CG system in the past has been the perception that it doesn't link very well with the national systems at all. I mean, I think the reform process really has is, is, is vaulting it forward in this way. And, so it was very nice at this research workshop that, that I attended just to see this kind of interaction and excitement um, as the scientists uh, discovered that they, you know, this and other programs are going to allow them to, to work much more closely together. So, okay, I think I'm going to, uh, to sit down, um, but not before I address the fourth area, which is promoting institutional coordination and communication. And, you know, I think that is such an important point for us. Um, but it sort of takes me back to, to the beginning of, you know, well, we have CADAP, uh, Feed the Future, very, very aligned with country priorities, but, you know, we're, we're waiting uh, for countries to come forward, you know, and, and define what are their capacity strengthening uh, priorities uh, that relate to their, their country investment plans. So I think, you know, without that, uh, you know, we're, we're in a bit of a, a bind right now because, you know, you have the U.S. interest, uh, interested and uh, the U.S. increasing its investments in this area. You know, of course, other partners, the World Bank as well, uh, the European Union donors, others. Um, but we're all, you know, in danger of sort of uh, fragmenting our, our, our efforts, you know, unless there's this strong guide. So, um, so we need, I would say, a bit more leadership from our African partners um, and, and assistance uh, as, as, as required to, to help them come up with this. So thanks. Look forward to your, your questions. Again, thanks a lot to CSIS. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I really appreciate that. I, one, th one thing that's striking is that we there's so much consensus around some of the challenges, some of the issues, some of the way forward. But this is still, this is still new territory. And it's going to be uh, an experiment to see how some of these things work out, because no one has the key as much as we think we have the general direction. Um, but moving in, knowing that we agree on the general direction, I think, is a, is a positive point. And as you pointed out several months ago, there's been a revolution in talking about food and agriculture since 2008, and that's a, a hugely important sign. But you've once again cemented your place as the most knowledgeable person I know on Africa and agriculture, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to open to questions in just a minute, but I want to say just a couple things. Um, first, on ICT, which you mentioned, um, we mentioned it very briefly, but in our conversations, we heard so much sort of disagreement about what role communications technology can actually play given disparities in um, internet connections, in student levels. If you try to do um, distance learning with, an, with a, say, a, an American university and an African university, sometimes the students are at such different levels of knowledge that makes it difficult to have that joint class. So this is an area that is ripe for um, further development, but wasn't really, um, it wasn't sort of a right now answer. It's going to take some, um, probably some case by case work. Livestock is, is hugely important. I grew up on a livestock farm in Minnesota, so I always want to say we can't forget that, that cattle and pigs and sheep and chickens and ducks are so important to families. So I um, agree, because we get caught up in grains and cereals a lot. Um, and then I think just mentioning, we talked 
this is a, looking at the research agenda. It's looking at how we get more research going. There's a huge element of disseminating research, of technology transfer, of how farmers adopt technologies and use them that we don't, that we don't address, but I, I don't want to leave anyone with the impression that we think that if you develop the technology, it's all going to work out, because that's a whole other um, piece of the puzzle um, that we, we didn't have in the scope of our study, but it's certainly very important. So with that, I think we have about 15, 20 minutes for questions if we'd like to start uh, right here. And if you can just take the microphone and just inter uh, Hi, I'm Chris Sunman from Booz Allen Hamilton, and um, I'm completely new to food security and agriculture in Africa. Uh, my training is in political science, so um, this is really interesting to me. I have a question and then a suggestion, possibly. My question is, um, <laughs> I think developing ag in Africa is critical, especially given food security issues on the continent. But my question is, um, I was recently at an Angola conference where they were talking about how Angola would like to diversify its economy by moving into agriculture in particular, but it faces a lot of de other development problems before it can actually do that, one of which is developing infrastructure. So how, how do you deal with um, those integrated development issues, or how, sh how are you thinking about that? And my suggestion is, um, I'm a political scientist, I belong to the American Political Science Association, and we have the same sort of issue or problem with knowledge transfer and, and scientific knowledge transfer in the social sciences. One thing that APSA did wa was create a program where um, every year we have workshops on the continent where African grad students are invited to participate and we send um, senior and junior and graduate students from the US over there and we have a summer long uh, workshop on how to conduct social science research um, and stuff like that. It's been very productive for us and it builds a lot of mentoring relationships that are long lasting. Um, so it might be an idea for how to do the knowledge transfer part and short-term kind of things. And um, I'm a UC Davis student. I just have to tell you a funny story. This is my only experience with agriculture. No, it involves dirt. <laughs> I was in Senegal doing research and I got a call from another grad student at UC Davis who was doing soil science something in San Luis and he asked me, oh, would you mind taking my box of dirt home to Davis? <laughs> so I trucked his huge box of dirt home, which was really funny to try to think of how to say dirt in French and get through customs, but it all worked out. Yes. Thank you. Earthy and sexy all at one time. <laughs> Why don't we take a couple more questions and we'll take a round. Okay, here and then here. Uh, Joel Barkin, CSIS. I'd like to comment on, on UC Davis. Uh, maybe they can help the wine industry be more competitive for South African wines. Um, my question uh, is as follows. Um, actually, first I want to make a comment. The idea that, I hope you're not totally rejecting the model of the past in terms of U.S. land-grant uh, universities. Yes, U.S. state institutions are under um, great pressure, but the fact of the matter is at the graduate level, most students are educated for free because they're given TA ships. We need uh, students, and curriculums have changed, so that shouldn't be totally written off. The question I want to ask, though, is given the varying conditions across the continent, uh, politically and also with respect to ec economic development, one thing I haven't heard in your presentations is the e identification of two or three or four examples of where the type of research you are calling for and which is demand given, driven is actually going on and where some partnerships are emerging, uh, what they suggest for models that would be replicated uh, elsewhere, and also given the state of African universities, might the African Capacity Building Foundation, which is mainly focused on the social sciences, uh, segue over into the agricultural sciences uh, to support uh, standalone independent research uh, centers uh, which have not been a p panacea in the social science field but which have 
uh, yielded some uh, fairly good uh, uh, policy research analysis uh, in the economic area, such as Kipra in Kenya. Thank you. Or did look at kind of the, the science aspect, but as I started my remarks, a number of the other reports look at the multiple competing priorities. And one of the, you know, infrastructure being one of them, credit, access to credit, access to fertilizer, access to even your most basic technologies, and so for the extension, how do you disseminate whatever technologies already exist out there? So there's, you know, government policies, uh, trade barriers. I mean, there's, there's a whole myriad of things. I think what happens when there are those multiple competing priorities is that research often kind of gets pushed aside um, because it, 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 it's a long, it takes a long time to feel the impact of, of building research capacity or even, well, even, even working on some of these difficult problems of pest disease or resilience. So, um, you know, the challenge for a, a developing country is to, you know, do these at, you know, kind of simultaneously at the same time, and there are many interlocked pieces of a puzzle. Science alone is not going to solve any problem if you've got bad agricultural policy. So these all have to be addressed in tandem. Um, that maybe brings me a little bit to, to Joel's point about kind of centers of excellence or, uh, or, or training, um, just to tackle one aspect of that. Because you're not going to be able to expect every African country, in a way, to build up an indigenous science establishment that's going to, you know, with 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 breakthroughs. I mean, I, you know, there's there's some that just don't have the resources to invest in that kind of thing. But there are regional centers, and University of Makerere is one. The Kenyan agricultural research uh, is is particularly it's it's well endowed. It's got a huge number of PhDs. They do a lot of collaborations within East Africa, bringing Ugandan scientists and Tanzanian scientists. And then there are the um, Ilris and, you know, the uh, base. East Africa is particularly well endowed with those because when it was the community, these research institutes kinds of served as, as regional research institutes. Right, yeah. Uh, invest, invested. So, I mean, there's, there, and maybe Julie, you want to talk about if there's thought of investing in kind of centers of excellence model um, that have regional versus simply national impact. Thanks for those good questions. And as a UC Davis grad, I appreciate that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, on, on the, the problem of integrated development, I mean, that, that's really key. I mean, before I came into government and worked with the Research and Advocacy Group, one of the key reports that we did was what's the relationship of infrastructure uh, to agricultural development? Because, you know, that along with, with research and universities, it tends to be, you know, one of those things that are is too expensive for any one donor or too expensive for the government to do on its own. And, and it's it's hard. You just don't have an advocacy group built around either of those. So can you... Can continues to be challenge, challenging, but I think we're, we're, we're better than we used to be at understanding that, I mean, the system has to work, right? It's not enough just to have, you know, a, a, a stream of scientists coming out if there's no way to get the technology adopted. You know, if you don't have an extension system, if you don't have roads for farmers to get produce to market, et cetera, et cetera. So, so not easy, but I think, you know, we're co comprehending things in, in a systems aspect. Um, I want to say, Joel, I mean, definitely we are not rejecting the model of the land grant. Um, I have very clear in my mind um, a, a trip that we did back to before I came into USAID with the uh, Mali ambassador to Michigan State University. And we were having a roundtable discussion with Michigan State's provost and ag experiment station uh, director and, and a host of other senior university officials. And the Mali ambassador said, how do you do this in the land grant? He goes, I, I want this for my country. I, I want um, maybe not necessarily the entire land grant institution, but I want this, this essence, which is the university feels driven to address the problems of society. He said, this is so important and what we so lack in, in West Africa. So I think that, I mean, that, that, that drives us. Um, and that was really the core of Administrator Shaw's message in San Francisco, you know, saying we're back, you know, we're investing in U.S. universities because we understand that this essence of the land-grant model is something, you know, we need to help 
um, our African colleagues uh, adapt to their own circumstances. Um, in, in terms of partnerships, I guess, yes, I would say McCary and uh, the universities in, in, in Kenya, National Agricultural Research Systems, we don't have wonderful examples really of university research collaboration yet, you know, because if you ask people why, they say, well, it's because it's, a, it's not a land grant system. It's not all housed in one university. There's, you know, the universities are under the Ministry of Education. The National Ag Research Systems are under the Ministry of Agriculture. So, so we struggle with that. But McCary, um, you know, for, for, for my vote, you know, has done a better job than many, you know, in really trying to, to place students with the National Ag Research System and, and create, you know, funding opportunities back and forth. So, so I think that that's something for us. Now, in terms of whether um, the African Capacity Building Foundation, you know, I think is, is, is a very interesting model. You know, I, I've been thinking in recent days about um, especially policy research, um, which doesn't fit neatly oftentimes in either universities or national ag research systems, and you'd want something of an independent body. And uh, they've served that function, I know, in, in, in many countries. And, you know, as we get into um, what's the role of subsidies or what's the role of sort of the, these integrated systems, it may very well be that, that we need to think again about that kind of model uh, for economic policy um, analysis and building that capacity, building um, modeling capacity um, that is based on agriculture, but also extends to other areas of the economy. So, so thanks for that reminder. Great, and, and just a footnote, you had a group in when you're still at the partnership from Mali, and they just, they were amazed that in the U.S., a farmer can call up a researcher at a university and ask a question about something he's developed or say, could, could you do it this way or how should I plant it? It was really a phenomenal um, experience for them, and they really said, that's what we want. Um, okay, in the front here. Hi, I'm Don Crane. Uh, I'm wondering, Julie, um, uh, how you see the individual countries in general meeting their CADAP strategies and their investment plans, and are there any that are doing particularly well? Uh, right um, good afternoon. My name is Nee Simmons. Um, I want to thank you guys for putting together a report. Um, before I came here, um, well, my first thing, I'm first generation Ghanaian American and uh, I co-founded the Day Network and we have about 4,000 individuals in the diaspora who've worked for major agriculture companies, Unilever, Coke, Hershey's, any co um, company that you can think of. We, you, we have an African has worked there or currently is working there. I go to a lot of these meetings and um, I was told about this meeting last minute like yesterday, and I told one of my friends who I went to business school with, he's a VC, and another guy, he's a private equity person, he said, nee, why do you waste your time going to these um, events? You know, what, what's, why are you doing it? I'm like, well, I, I hope to change their opinion on how they're doing, um, doing things in Africa because I don't think it's sustainable. And these guys collectively have about, I would say about $40 million that they are managing. And they're telling me all the time for the past six years they can't find deal flow, meaning they can't find ideas to invest in. So the Day Network, we use the diaspora who have experiences in agriculture to provide mentorship for people who have innovations and technologies to help with alleviating post-harvest losses. Now, I don't hear anything in this report. I don't see anything in the report about engaging wow. diaspora. Also, there's a myth there's no money in Africa. There's actually a lot of money in Africa. There's, there isn't just enabling environment, like the Silicon Valley. If you look at all these technology companies, Twitter, Facebook, they, start, they got started in incubators, enable environments. We really need to engage a diaspora and provide incubation, agriculture incubation, kind of like that's been done here. So I really want us to think outside the box and figure out how to engage people like me in the diaspora who are, you know, it's, you mentioned agro in, re, in the report, which is nice and dandy, but I've, my friends who are VCs, they don't want to, it's, it's like, I mean, these guys are career politicians, they're career diplomats, you know, they, they don't understand how to scale a business, get investors, you know, they, they have experiences in supply chain management, marketing, I, I don't hear people talking about that, and some of these guys, I hate to say this, I know USA doesn't like to hear this, they're going to Brazil, they're going to China, you know, and if we build this nexus of, of, of businesses that can scale.
then we can, they're going to be buying John Deere equipment, Caterpillar. We can support you as jobs. So that's really what we really need to talk about. Thank you. I'm Jin Ningwen, Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I um, like to tag on to what he suggested. And I feel that if you also involve the people, the local people, and I know that there has been here um, an actor, Matt Denman, who is very much involved in water, in how to bring water to the people, which for us, water would be one of the key. But he brings it in in the form of establishing NGO, civil society, and it will be another form of infrastructure, human infrastructure, and social infrastructure as well. And it will immediately answer the needs and bring in the cooperations of the diaspora, the philanthropy, and also build up the infrastructure um, for the local people. I have a friend who works um, for 20, 30 years for USAID, and he worked at different areas um, where he come, he worked for Deloitte, and he comes and have a project for certain, like West Africa or so, and they have a lot of problems with cops and worms about this time of the year, maybe next year, next month in February. There's like, um, I forgot what kind of worms that happened last year in, in an area in Africa. That turns into an app, um, like, a disaster, the whole village was covered with worms. And some things like that just happened because of the weather changes. And many times when we hear and we talk about planning and projects, we don't expect or we don't have the experience, but the people there can help you. Okay, that's, great. that's a great point. And I'm going to have you pass just right behind you there. This will be the last question, and we'll go around. Uh, David through CSIS. Um, <laughs> I'm a little nervous, and I think, I think you have to disaggregate the various research centers and universities that you're talking about very carefully. I've been doing work in Kenya and, and Ghana, and it strikes me that there is a quite serious debate going on within the Department of Agriculture in the universities in Ghana in particular, but also to a lesser extent in Kenya, about what their role is and what is the future of our graduates. And I think there's a very profound degree of dissatisfaction with the status quo, uh, which is that the teaching of agriculture in those institutions has been heavily scientific. It has been very traditional, um, very similar in certain respects, so perhaps less sophisticated, than you would get in uh, an American or European institution. And the old guard in departments of agriculture very much want to protect that scientific heritage uh, and see the future very much as the past. The reformers say this is totally irrelevant, that we need to dump all this scientific crop breeding kind of stuff that we have to think what is the role of our graduates? How many of them are actually going to be scientific researchers? The answer is virtually none. Uh, a few of them are going to be agricultural extension officers, but not very many. Uh, and most of them are actually going to go into the greater economy. Virtually none of them are going to become farmers. And the reformers are saying we actually need to restructure the nature of the teaching in agricultural departments in Africa to make it more relevant to the day-to-day -day experience of ordinary African farmers. And actually, we ought to be producing a new generation of commercial agricultural producers who can act as a catalyst for the wider smallholder community. Now, if that is the debate that's going on, it's suggesting a very, very different trajectory for agricultural departments from the ones that you are outlining. Um, and I'm a little nervous that this is an American-driven project rather than an African-driven project. And I wonder if we had actually 
agronomists and uh, agricultural economists and agricultural teachers uh, in agricultural extension services uh, from African universities, whether they would actually uh, sign up to your paradigm of development or if they'd have a very, very different vision. David, um, you always ask the easiest questions. <laughs> I'm going to just stop you there because right. I think that's a that's a lot to consider. We have uh, want to look at um, just an update on CADAP goals, the role of diaspora, and then just sort of what is the future of graduates and how do you think about that? Do you want to start, Julie? Sure. Thanks for that, that great round of questions. Um, Don, on, on CADAP, um, yes. I mean, I, we have every year a report comes out from the, the RESACs folks um, on, on the web on how well countries are doing in terms of meeting their, uh, their pledges that they made in 2003, the heads of state, to um, increase investment in agriculture to 10% um, to of their national budgets um, in order to, to reach a growth rate of 6%. I think if you look at those reports, you'll see that, that, that many countries by now really are exceeding the 6% growth rate. Um, some are meeting the 10%, not, not enough. Right, and then there's a question of what does 10 percent mean? Because I'm not convinced that we're, you know, we're measuring it. So countries like Ethiopia, for example, and others are way above the 10 percent, but we're not quite sure. You know, there's it's not quite enough rigor yet um, in in how we're tracking those investments. So, so good questions. You know, I think we're doing we're doing better on that score. Um, there's been some discussion among the heads of state and in the African Union about you know a potential. A renewal or recommitment, a Maputo II kind of agreement. So, you know, I think you know we we, we could use kind of a B12 uh, vitamin shot um, into the CADAP process, and um, we need just as uh, you know, NEPAD um, was um, was really engineered by by lead African presidents, so Obasanjo and uh, uh, the South African president and Becky and, and others. You know, we sort of need that vanguard of, of new African presidents who will champion African agriculture and not only these goals, but 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 new ones as well. So so thanks for that question, um, Diaspora. Um, I'd love to have your card, please. Um, and I. I think you know we're seeing a quiet revolution really taking place um, in many parts of Africa where you're seeing um, a lot of private sector investment starting to go on now. Um, and even you know folks who have spent time outside in private sector outside their countries coming back to either form new businesses or you know in the case of Ethiopia, we're seeing you know a number of the the senior advisors. Uh, to the prime minister, our, our returned expatriates, you know, who have a different kind of, 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 uh, of, of channel uh, to the leaders. So I think things, things are changing more than perhaps you, you know, but I think we, we definitely uh, need to figure out how to better engage the diaspora. You know, personally, I think that the, the next revolution in, in Africa is going to be one of private sector investment, you know, and uh, how are we really, really seriously working our way out of development assistance because I think, you know, s economies, uh, developed economies, the development assistance is, is going to go down. It's not going to go. It's not going to go up. Um, and, and in any case, for sustainability's sake, you know, it's all about creating jobs, and that's what the private sector does. And who better to, to really fuel that, you know, than, than folks in the diaspora who have that, both the experience outside, but also the, the inside knowledge of their countries. So really would appreciate having your, your card on that. Um, and, and to your point, involving the local, I couldn't agree more, right? And that's why I'm, I'm so pleased, I mean, that we're, we're all sort of saying, yes, it's country-driven strategies, um, yes, these strategies have to be done in consultation with civil society, and, and I mean we're always asking those questions as we as we as we are uh, uh, going about implementing Feed the Future. Um, okay, David's question, very very interesting on on, on universities. Um, yes, you know I, I think though again most universities are sort of in that path, like McCary. Um, even 10 years ago, um, there are probably people here who can know the story better than I do. Um, but, I mean, McCary suddenly woke up and said, gosh, you know, our graduates are unemployable. You know, perhaps we better have a, have a chat with the private sector and figure out what it is that they need to have in our graduates. And they redesigned their entire agribusiness program, and Ohio State was very involved with that. And so I think that's, 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 going, that's going on. Um, you, you see um, 
when you when you speak to folks in in um, in many countries, we're just seeing sort of a, a mushrooming of universities. You know, so and I think part of that is because you know we have a universal universal primary and increasingly universal secondary education, and that's fueled an incredible demand you know, for higher education. You know, which unfortunately is is a very variable quality. But you know, one of the fastest growth sectors I think is is business schools. I mean, you see these kind of commercial uh, schools popping up everywhere. You know, with people wanting to to learn, you know, computer skills or wanting to learn basic business skills. So I think, I mean, you're right. It's a, it's a, it's a new world. Um, I think we're already out of the old model. You know, I certainly don't want to give the impression that 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 the U.S. government, you know, is is for investing in the old model because I think we're we're really trying hard as we ramp up our investments in African universities and ag research systems to pay attention to what our, our colleagues in Africa are telling us that they want and the employers are telling us that they want. Um, you probably heard my frustration, you know, saying that we want them to get those plans together um, so that we're not going off on our own, uh, our own designs. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't say I've done a systematic survey. and <laughs> I mean, actually, that would be interesting to do in terms of where is the debate within the universities. I mean, people I've talked to in a number of countries, Zambia, Kenya, um, Uganda, West Africa as well, I mean, it is kind of the demand to be relevant and to be connected with um, kind of a, a, pra a more practical research agenda. I mean, the problem with a lot of universities that I talked to was that um, you know, funding f funding comes from the education ministry, um, which is you know for for whom agriculture is kind of a minor afterthought. And agriculture, the agriculture ministries on agricultural research are less likely to fund the universities than they are the the national research centers. So, agricultural research is just kind of falls between the cracks of those ministries, and that's in a number of countries. It's not um, uh, so. I mean, I think. The, the demand, and you hear kind of the reaction of the Malians looking at the land grant university system. I, I heard the same thing a lot in Zambia as well. Kind of how do you connect, how do you place students in the real world of where they're living, which is connected with farmers, connected with communities, and connected with policymakers? And to my mind, that was the stronger demand, kind of a much more than kind of the, the old kind of abstract high, high level science education that. that you know, yeah, sounds, you know, it's like t taking Latin in, <laughs> you know, uh, David used to be a professor of Latin in Kenya, so <laughs> just teasing him a little bit on that. But, uh, um, <laughs> which I think has, it has a certain importance in structuring your thinking, but I mean, I think the demand is much more on the pragmatic, immediate relevance side. All right, well, I, that brings us to the end of our time. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks, Max, for your support. And thank you to Julie and to Jennifer for your really fascinating comments.